They say a picture is worth a thousand words. If that's the case, these next few minutes of film will save me having to write a book. Or maybe just the suicide note. It will also maybe teach you something in these minutes that you never learned before in all your years of schooling. Some years ago, I was asked to represent Chivas Regal Whiskey Company on some promotional trips to China. For me, it was like going to the moon. Part of the job was when the expert executives of the whiskey company presented the facts about how whiskey was distilled to the Chinese importers of their national drink. My part in it was to tell them a few things about Scotland and our history. This all took place during the seminars every morning and it was always entertaining. I would start by explaining where Scotland was on the map and comparing it to the size of China. You know. Then based on a tea towel that they sell here in tourist shops with basic information about some famous Scottish inventors, you've maybe seen it yourself, I then elaborated on it in my own way. Just recently I've painted the visual image of more of these men and women and I wished I could have had it with me at the time back then. Invariably, every meeting room had seminar for the seminars would have a TV screen in it for presentations etc. This would give me a chance to inform them of the man John Logie Beard from Helensborough in Scotland who invented the television. Always you would see a head rising at this wee interesting fact. We would be in big hotels, sometimes it would be 20-30 stories up, and I'd, I would ask them to come with me to the window and look down on the roads below. Always there was hundreds if not thousands of bicycles in the streets in whatever city we were in, be it Beijing or Shanghai or Shenyang, wherever. And I would explain that the bicycle that they were looking at was invented by a Scottish man called Kirkpatrick Macmillan from Dumfries in Scotland. Now they're all looking at each other as if they say, did you know that? The first bicycle, which was called the Velocipede, had wooden wheels and iron rims on it. Must have been very uncomfortable riding it. Then a man called John Dunlop from Dreghorn in Ayrshire invented the first pneumatic tyre, which is now also in every car in the world. So things were beginning to get a lot easier thanks to these Scottish inventions. Before I took them back to their seats, I would point to the roads below that they were travelling on. Those roads are covered with tar there as they are here. And a road builder and engineer called John McAdam from Ayr in Scotland was responsible for this method of building these very same roads. Usually a phone would go off in the room at some point and that would give me another introduction to another great Scottish inventor without whom such communication would be impossible. Alexander Graham Bell from Edinburgh in Scotland invented the telephone. We a side note about that. Bell refused to have a telephone in his own house as he considered it would be an intrusion on his own serious work and studies. There would always be an interval during these seminars and teas and coffees were always served. 
Teas and coffees were presented in vacuum flasks and that kept me on a roll as I could tell them that a man called James Dewar from Kincardine in Scotland was a chemist and physicist who invented a vacuum flask. So there would be no such teas and coffees served today like this without the Scotsman's inventions. Vacuum flasks are also used of course now in industry and in hospitals. After one such seminar of endless information about great Scottish inventors, we thank them for their attention and their interest and wish them a safe journey home. Just as they were leaving, it began to rain and one or two of them produced umbrellas and raincoats, which let me launch into some information about a Glasgow man, Charles McIntosh, who has invented the same waterproof material that was now protecting them. All he did then was for somebody to give us a verse of Lang Syne, and that would set me off in a whole new story about a famous guy from Ayrshire on my back. At this point, I'm far from finished. You've heard of Albert Einstein. No, he wasn't Scottish. But he did say that his own studies in the world of science would have had no starting point had it not been for the guidance of one James Clark Maxwell from Edinburgh, who was voted the third greatest physicist scientist of all time. Among other things, it was Maxwell who discovered the rings around Saturn were not solid rings, but actually particles in space. I have a pal from Burnbank whose own scientific theory was that the Saturn rings were composed entirely of lost airline luggage. It's just a guess right enough, but mind you, half the guys I went to school with still point at aeroplanes in the sky. Number 10 on this list was David Livingston from Blantyre, who was a great mystery explorer who was obsessed with finding the source of the Nile so that he could influence the end of the um, East African Arab Swahili slave trade. He's buried in Westminster Abbey. Number 11, an untidy Scottish physician, microbiologist from Darville and Ayrshire, luckily discovered the substance called penicillin in September 1928 which has been a lifesaver now of millions of people throughout the world. Sir Alexander Fleming was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology in 1945. Number 12 on my last year was Scottish chemist James Young from Glasgow, who discovered how you could distill paraffin from coal and oil shells. Scottish people were always good at distilling things. He was forever after known as Paraffin Young. Number 13 was a man called John Muir. Now, the American national parks such as Yosemite, Sequoia National Park, the Sierra Nevada, and many other such may not be so revered today had it not been for this man from Dunbar, John Muir, also known as John of the Mountains. And it was him who convinced the then President Theodore Roosevelt that their great wildernesses, like these places I mentioned, should be treasured and preserved forever. Number 14 is Mary Slessor, an Aberdeen woman, who followed in the footsteps of David Livingston to Africa, where she is still much loved for her humanitarian help to the native people there in the latter part of the 1800s. 
Number 15, a Scottish author, Nigel Tranter, was born in Glasgow, but lived most of his life in Aberlady in East Lothian. Some say he's second only to Sir Walter Scott in his output of writings and novels about Scottish history. He was also a personal friend for about 20 years, and it was my own honour to be able to say farewell to him at his funeral in the year 2000, the way Scots people do by playing pipes at his graveside. And I still miss him. I mentioned Sir Walter Scott there. He was from Edinburgh and among the very first to combine his writings and form what we now call novels. They're part of our everyday life, modern life now. But they didn't exist before him. The novel didn't exist before Sir Walter Scott. Number 17 was Andrew Carnegie from Dunfermline. He was the richest man in the world. A business magnate who led the way in the expansion of the American steel industry. He made hundreds of millions of dollars and then gave it all away to charities, science, universities and libraries. Tell me you're not proud of him. Number 18 was The Colossus of Rhodes, R-H-O-D-E-S. It's the title of a famous book. But Thomas Telford from Dumfriesshire was often referred to as The Colossus of Rhodes, R-O-A-D-S, due to his engineering genius for building roads, bridges, canals and harbours. The world of engineering learned much from this Scotsman. The introduction of anaesthesia for women in childbirth was a true godsend discovered by the Bathgate man James Young Simpson. He passed his final obstetrician exam when he was underage at 18 at Edinburgh University. Another very clever Scotsman whom we're very thankful for. Number 20 was the Industrial Revolution. It still might be in its infancy had it not been for the improvement to the steam engine by the Greenock man, James Watt. Every steam engine in the world thereafter worked wonders and industry thrived like never before, thanks to James Watt. My last one here is number 21. He was called the Sea Wolf by Napoleon Bonaparte. Admiral Nelson advised him to be his own man and don't listen to the so-called experts of this world. Thomas Cochrane was born in Hamilton. He became the 10th Earl of Dundonald and eventually Admiral of the British Fleet. But not before he upset the government and the Royal Navy with his own individual ideas and a most fantastic naval career. After being told that his ideas on warfare weren't civilised, which is a contradiction in terms, as no warfare is civilised, he left the British Navy and set sail for the Americas. There he created the first ever Navy for Chile and brought about independence for them by chasing the Portuguese out of their country. He then did the same thing for Brazil, creating their first ever navy for them and securing their independence too. He did the same thing for Peru before heading back to Europe where he helped Greece with their first ever navy by chasing the Turks out of Greece. One of his seagoing colleagues, a man named Marriott, retired from the Navy and began writing fictional adventure stories based on the life of his old captain. The fictional hero in these stories was given the name Horatio Hornblower. So now you know who he really was. Russell Crowe also played the character based on Thomas Cochrane in the Hollywood movie Master and Commander. 
Cochrane is buried in Westminster Abbey, and once every year, the Brazilian Navy are the only ones allowed to bear arms there in that cathedral and salute to the great man for what he did for their country. So there you have it. My own wee salute to Scotland's gift to the world of inventors, explorers, authors, scientists and engineers. I could talk now forever about them, till doomsday. It's fantastic. Here's tears. Was like us. Damn few and the wrong deed. Scotch whiskey. Now there's a story. Did I mention that? Well, a thousand years ago, 